All right, well, good evening, folks. Good to see you all here tonight. For those of you who are online, it is a nasty night. So every one of you, I'm going to recommend to the Lord that you get a star in your crown. So uh, for those of you who are on, um, on Facebook and are watching tonight, um, I'll give you a half a star for a crown. Well, I'm going to recommend it. I, I'm not the one into doing that, so anyway. Glad you could be with us. Um, we are, were obviously not online last week because of uh, Thanksgiving, the holiday. But uh, we're back at it tonight, so uh, appreciate those of you who are tuning in and those of you who are here. Uh, if you have a prayer list and you are inside this auditorium, uh, on the back of it, there are a couple of announcements that I need to share with you. First and foremost, the International Missions Banquet, we have decided to cancel that. Um, I let the WMU ladies make that decision. Uh, we had printed off 100, 100 tickets. Only 30 had been uh, uh, grabbed. They were free, just needed to grab them. And um, so Carolyn and them felt like that we needed more than that to actually do what we needed to do. So there will be no International Missions Banquet this coming Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And then the Secret Sis um, get-together that they normally have uh, has been canceled too. I think there's some information in last week's bulletin and... Uh, just for your all's information, those of you who are online who have refused to call the church office because you know that Terry Hillis is not in the office. She will be there tomorrow, though. So you can start calling again. Uh, we, we guys have been in there, me and Daniel, but, you know, and then we've had some ladies who have helped us. But um, we know that we don't have all the answers and that Terry does. So anyway, she'll be back tomorrow. Uh, also, the Melanie Cumby Memorial Service, I visited with uh, Earl this past week, and uh, that is this coming Saturday at 2 o'clock here in the auditorium. And then we're going to have a reception for those of you who feel comfortable with that. We're going to be over in the Fellowship Hall and we'll give you an opportunity to visit with Earl. And uh, I believe he is going to stay through uh, the Sunday service. Uh, he told me his desire at this point probably is to go home on Monday. So he should be in our service this coming Sunday as well. So just make sure that you, if you can, get an opportunity to make contact uh, with him and uh, let him know that uh, you are thinking of him and during this uh, time of loss uh, for him. And uh, I know that he would appreciate it. And then the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, we, we were supposed to have started the week of prayer last week, and we kind of messed up with all some of our staff being gone. So we will show, uh, show a video this coming Sunday, and then we will begin to uh, emphasize uh, a little bit more on that. Uh, as you know, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering go, uh, goes straight, straight to the International Missions, it goes on the field. It does not go for salaries for our missionaries. Those are paid through the cooperative program, whereas we give weekly our tithes and offerings. But this goes directly to the mission field to help projects. Might be a water well project, might be a building that needs to be built, uh, something like that. So our goal is $7,650. We've been very blessed in years past to have some good offerings in that regard. So let me encourage you to pray about that. There are offering envelopes uh, in the seats behind you, and I pray that you would consider giving uh, on a part of that uh, this, this year. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into our uh, subject matter tonight. Uh, we've been talking about... Uh, Victors being victors, and we're going to talk about the toxins that hurt us as uh, believers. We're going to talk about envy tonight. So if you're envious of any, anybody or have had a problem with envy, and I think all of us probably at one time or another have in some shape or fashion, 
I'm going to share with you some scripture tonight to maybe help you in that regard. So let's bow for a word of prayer together. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to be here tonight and for those who are online. Thank you, Father, for faithful people who are willing to uh, get involved into the study of God's Word. And Lord, as we meet here tonight in this auditorium and those that are watching, Lord, we have our children and our youth are meeting. And Lord, we've had some individuals who have uh, come down with uh, the virus uh, we've had some who are showing some symptoms that are quarantining, and we've had some of our own staff who have not been able to uh, be with us for some time. So, Father, we're just asking that you do a great work. Uh, we know that, uh, that the numbers are high uh, right now in and around our area, our state, and also our country. Just pray, Father, that you would continue to protect us. Many people are able to uh, survive this virus and to get well obviously there are some who cannot and we pray father for those families today who have lost loved ones we've recently had um, individuals who have lost loved ones we pray for uh, the west family uh, tonight we pray also for the smith family and lord we pray for um, brother earl as he will be coming uh, this coming uh, weekend and us having the memorial service for Melanie. Just pray, Father, for these families and for other families who have lost loved ones. We pray for in, uh, families who have been sick. We pray, Father, for healing. Lord, we're in between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and Lord, this is normally a, a time of year where we're excited and uh, happy about this time and uh, to celebrate the birth of Christ. I just pray, Father, that you would um, uh, keep us protected. Lord, we uh, feel like that Christmas is important and that coming to church and being a part of a, a church family uh, is essential. We also, we obviously understand there are people who are concerned about their health, and so that's why we offer the online uh, situation where people can join us. So, Lord, whatever the situation, we just pray, Father, that your will would be done. We thank you, Lord, for that which you do for us. And we pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. If you notice behind me and up and around, the individuals showed up Monday to help us with our uh, Christmas decoration. We have one more tree that's coming that's going to fill that void over there. But uh, we have this very beautiful tree over here that has the cross in front of it. And uh, so we've got some really special uh, people who know what they're doing in regards to decorating, and we appreciate their uh, help. And though we had men and women this past Monday who helped us, and appreciate those of you who uh, were a part of that. If you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to, I'm going to be moving this particular Bible study causes us to go to different places. But I want you to go to Proverbs chapter 14. We're going to look at a proverb in Proverbs 14.30 that is going to help us to get started with this idea of the, the toxin or the sin of envy. Under the title, Is the Grass Really Greener on the Other Side? You've heard the old proverb, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. I think there's an old little story uh, about that as well. This has been a problem uh, for humans since the fall of Adam. We have a tendency sometimes to not be satisfied in our situations. We look, we see somebody else, we observe a situation that causes us to think, hey, that situation's better than what, what I'm going through. I really would like to have that. And because of dissatisfaction, we have a tendency to uh, to allow ourselves to go in that direction thinking that's exactly what we need and it turns out it doesn't make us happy. Uh, folks, possessions will never uh, satisfy the soul. Uh, only Jesus can do that but he can certainly bless us with possessions in order for us to be able to give and to be able to meet the needs that we have. Now how many of you remember the game show, Let's Make a Deal with Monty Hall. You remember that one? 
Yeah, you know, uh, Monty would come down and he, you know, all these different people, they would dress up in some really interesting costumes. I mean, some of them, and I'm going to use the word interesting. That's probably the best word I can use at this time. But um, he would come down the aisle maybe, uh, uh, and someone would help him obviously, but he'd have a box on this tray. He'd see somebody and say, okay, uh, I like your costume. Uh, what's your name? And they'd introduce themselves and said, okay, I've got in my hand $100 here, and I'll give you this $100 cash, or you can have what's underneath the box. And, of course, the crowd starts going, hey, you know, get what's underneath the box. Take the $100, take the $100. You know, and sometimes people would take the $100, and then he would say, well, here's what you missed. And then he would raise it up, and it might be something good, might be something bad. And then sometimes if they decided uh, not on the cash, but they decided on the box, and say it was a nice, say it was, uh, you know, say it was a nice um, uh, appliance, I mean a small appliance, obviously, it couldn't be a big appliance, but say it's a, a nice small appliance that's worth some money, and so Monty would say now, okay, you've gone up from the $100 to this, but would you like to trade it for what's behind one of these three doors? And there would be Carol or whoever it was down there on the stage, and she, he could pick from door number one, door number two, door number three. And folks, what it was is that a lot of times that show would really entice people. Basically, you're not satisfied with what you have. Maybe you'll get something better. And sometimes people would. Sometimes behind door number two would be a Caribbean cruise. Sometimes behind door number one, it would be a new car. And sometimes behind door number three, it would be a donkey. So you just never knew, <laughs> okay? So uh, the idea of being content is kind of the opposite of the idea of envy. Satan uses envy to keep you and I from being contented. And folks, if we are content and we are happy in the Lord, we're giving him glory, we're, we are blessing we are living our lives in such a way that, uh, that people can see Jesus. And we are doing uh, the disciplines and the practices that God would want us. Instead of looking over on the other side and thinking that, oh, hey, that's, that's better than what I have. You ever bought something and then immediately found something better? And you thought, why didn't I wait for that? I don't ever want me to, you know, if I buy something, I don't want to ever hear the price of something else or hear about somebody getting a better deal or something because I, I just want to close my ears because I've decided, you know, if I did my homework or whatever, hopefully it'll be good enough. But anyway, uh, Hebrews 3, 13, 5, that's not where you're at right now, but here's what Hebrews 13, 5 says, make sure that your character is free from the love of money being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever ab abandon you. So envy is an enemy against the believer because it acts kind of like a chemical agent that is used in warfare. Just small amounts of envy can poison the Christian to the point that it will paralyze you in your walk with the Lord. So that's what I want to try to share with you tonight. Now Proverbs chapter 14, verse 30. There is a particular verse that I want us to look at there. Now I'm, uh, I usually read from the New American Standard, but uh, I'm going to uh, quote this verse tonight from the, uh, the ESV, the English Standard Version. And here's what it says in Proverbs 14:30. A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Now that's pretty, pretty explicit there, isn't it? A tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. So that's what I want us to... Uh, to kind of start with that particular verse, all right? So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to explain envy, okay? 
Can we agree tonight that our Creator knows what's best for us? He knows what's best for us with our mental health, our spiritual health, and even the health of our relationships. And, and listen, all three of those things are certainly uh, important, uh, our physical health as well. Uh, envy can debilitate us, and so that's why we need to guard against it. And we're going to, uh, to look at some situations here in just a moment. Now, the, the first thing I want you to see is that there are some exhortations in Scripture against envy. We've already read Proverbs uh, 14.30. Listen to what uh, uh, Romans 13.13, uh, 13. you don't have to, to turn there, but, but listen to this. It says, Let's behave, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and debauchery, not in strife and envy. Or the word jealousy can be used there as well. Folks, they put envy, the Apostle Paul there, when he talks about behaving properly, he puts envy in a list of, of uh, sins that we should not be doing, carousing and drunkenness, sexual promiscuity and debauchery, and then strife and then envy. Um, I believe that... The, uh, that Proverbs 14 that we read and even Romans 13 gives us a red flag, a warning against envy. Most dictionaries define envy as a feeling of discontent or resentment usually over the advantages or success of another. Have you ever been envious of a family member? Have you ever been envious of somebody else maybe in the profession that you're at, that you do. Now, let me share with you as a pastor. There are pastors that are preaching in bigger churches as far as numbers. There's one on every Sunday by the name of Joel Osteen. He has the Compact Center. That's where the Houston Rockets used to play basketball. Uh, they can seat about 20 to 25,000 people. And it, what I understand, they have about three or four services on a Sunday. So at one time, they may have as many as 100,000 people that will show up for services, okay? Now, it's a huge Lakewood church down there, his ministry, very large. And uh, I have some issues with uh, uh, Brother Olstein uh, as far as some of his theology and his health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. But I have to admit to you that he certainly is successful. And if you define success according uh, to the world's view or, or idea of success, they would say, hey, you know, Brother Olstein is successful. But folks, I, I want to be very, very honest with you. I am not envious of Joel Olstein. I don't want to mess with 100,000 people every Sunday. Now, not that, I, you know, if, if that's what God called me to do, I guess I'd do it. But I am content with where God has called me here in Grove, Oklahoma, to Grove's First Baptist Church. And, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, I believe that the, the, the desires of our hearts and what we need to be doing is not looking over on the other side of the fence and see if it, seeing if the grass is greener. And we as pastors have had that issue and that problem. Sometimes a pastor will get... Uh, disjointed and out of sorts with his congregation and he thinks the easiest thing to do is just go and leave and go somewhere else. But folks, that's not going to solve the issue. That's not going to solve the problem. So we need to understand that envy is a feeling of discontent or resentment and it's usually over the advantages or successes of, or of another. And uh, one of the I was trying to remember which one. I think it's um, Vines, uh, New Testament uh, Dictionary of Words. I believe it was him. Uh, he said that there's a distinction between envy and jealousy in, in Scripture. Envy desires to deprive another of what he has. Jealousy desires to have the same or the same sort of thing for itself. So envy, it's like, I'm angry enough or discontented enough, I want 
I want to grab and take what that person has. Whereas jealousy is, well, I'd just like to have what you have, okay? Or I'd just li like to have something like it. So we must be careful in this material world that we don't allow envy to take hold of our lives, okay? Now, there are some other passages of Scripture uh, in references uh, to uh, envy. It's listed in the uh, deeds of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Listen uh, to what it says here. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish, amb selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, it's sandwiched between factions and drunkenness, envy, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, folks, we shouldn't be practicing those things. We shouldn't be practicing envy. We should not be constantly um, upset and angry that somebody else has something maybe more than we have or a lot more than we have, whatever the situation but as a Christian, we should be able to win the battle over that. Not saying that we're going to win it every time, but we certainly need to keep our eyes on the Lord and His uh, glory. Uh, also, the word envy is found in the other list that is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, where it talks about God giving them over. And I think it's somewhere around verse 29, but it uses the term full of envy, which may imply that envy, you know, has degrees, and if you get filled up with it, certainly that is going to cause discontent in your life, okay? So that's the exhortations against envy. What are some of the examples of envy that we can find in Scripture? Well... There's one in Genesis chapter 30. How many of you remember the story of, um, of Jacob and Rachel? Remember Jacob was going to work uh, for Laban. He loved Rachel, but Rachel wasn't the oldest daughter. After seven years of work, uh, Laban really put a he, uh, well, he just tricked him. That's just all there is to it. And so that night it was Leah instead of Rachel. He had to work seven more years for Rachel. So he had Leah and Rachel. Now, in, um, in chapter, let's see, Genesis 30, verse 1, uh, it, it tells us there in chapter 29 leading up to, to chapter 30 that... Um, that Jacob loved Rachel obviously more than he loved Leah. But that created some issues as well. So God smiled upon Leah, and in that day and time, obviously, and in other times, to have children was a blessing, obviously. Well, Leah started having children, and Rachel didn't. Okay? So here, that's the pickup to chapter 30, verse 1. Here's what it says. Now, when Rachel saw that she had not borne Jacob any children... She became jealous or envious of her sister, and she said to Jacob, Give me children or else I am going to die. Uh, so you have a situation there where uh, you have an example of, of, of envy. Uh, God allowed Leah to have children. Rachel did not. And folks, this led to more strife and heartache within the family. And it can certainly do so today, okay? The same situation, Jacob had kind of followed him a little bit. Jacob with his son Joseph and the other brothers. You think the other brothers were a little, envi a little envious of uh, Joseph, especially when he got the, the coat of many colors? So there certainly was an example there of strife and envy uh, that went on. Now, there, Cain and Abel, there's a situation there that you can read in Genesis, I believe chapter 4. Uh, now, if you go into the New Testament, you will find in Matthew chapter 27, 
you will find Pilate in Matthew chapter 27. It's actually verses 11 through 18. But listen to what verse 18 says. For he knew that it was because of envy that they had handed him over. And speaking of Jesus, speaking of the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they handed Jesus over. They wanted him crucified because they were envious of him. Why? Because Jesus' crowds were greater than the crowds and what he was doing, he was healing people. He spoke with authority. And these men, you would think that the religious leaders would be happy and excited about someone preaching with authority God's word. And that just shows the condition of their heart, okay? So uh, that's an example. And then if you go to Acts chapter 13 and verse 45... Again, you have another situation. Um, it says, But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Uh, again, they were uh, filled with jealousy, filled with envy. Uh, they didn't like that Paul was getting the crowds and, and those type of things. And so and it says they even got to the point that they were blaspheming or they were uh, you know, uh, speaking ill will uh, of, of Paul, okay? So these are these examples. And folks, there's a toxic effect when it comes to envy in these situations, okay? And we need to understand that. So that's some of the examples, okay? Now, what is the effects of envy? I want you to turn to James chapter 3, if you would, for just a moment. James chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. And this, James, uh, in his little letter, gives us some help on the effects of envy. He warns us of these effects in uh, chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Let's, uh, let's, let me read that for you. I'm reading from the New American Standard. It says, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. Folks, when there is envy and strife, uh, when envy and strife fills our hearts or gets a hold of us, uh, folks, uh, all there is is uh, discord. Uh, all there is, according to this, is disorder and every evil thing. And it can lead to things even worse uh, than envy, okay? So envy begins subtly within the individual. It begins to drain the joy and peace out of a believer's heart. Folks, it can cause physical problems. We read a while ago in Proverbs 14.30, a tranquil heart gives life to the flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. I think clearly from that proverb uh, that uh, envy can cause emotional stress. It can cause physical issues within our lives. Stop and think about it. The peace of God, the tranquil nature of God, uh, having those things within our heart. Envy is the exact opposite because we're not happy and, and we'll explain that in just a little bit. We're not happy with the situation. We're envious. We're mad. And we're, it's causing strife uh, within our hearts. Uh, so uh, it can cause physical problems. Eventually it will seep out into a believer's relationships with other Christians. Instead of being happy for someone in their success, we become envious and it, and it causes friction and problems. I have seen this happen in people's lives. Instead of rejoicing over somebody with a promotion, or instead of rejoicing uh, with somebody over maybe something that they were blessed with, uh, uh, you know, whatever it may be, new house, whatever, okay? Instead of rejoicing with them and, and really truly embracing that, we uh, become un unhappy, okay? Uh, envy affects the Christian and also the body of Christ. Resentment over another's success or his possessions challenges the very character of God. 
Folks, when we are envious of someone, our fellow brother in Christ, or brother or sister, here, here's what we're basically saying. God, you don't understand. I don't think you're right in what you're doing, and you are just not fair. That's what we're saying with envy. You see, envy refuses to give God the glory, and in turn it challenges his, his sovereignty. The word sovereignty within the word sovereignty is the word reigns. God reigns. Listen, folks, if God wants to bless somebody that we don't maybe don't understand about it, that's his prerogative. We need to understand that, okay? And we just need to uh, have the peace of God, okay? And rejoice. So that's the effects of envy. What can happen if we don't allow uh, the Lord Jesus Christ to get a hold of our lives? Uh, folks, we need to be happy. We need to be content where we're at. Contentment is wonderful. Um, it, it, it is something when God gives us um, I have seen people be content uh, for many years in uh, a certain place. God just continues to give them contentment. Um, it may be in a job situation. Uh, it could be in, in many other different ways, okay? Now, so that is explaining envy to you tonight. The second thing I want to do is we need to extinguish Envy, okay? Envy is successful in getting into Christ, a Christian's thinking when he resents what God has per permitted in another person's life and is discontent with his own lot in life. And folks, sometimes it may be because we're not where God wants us to be that we become envious of someone else, okay? Need to understand that tonight. Uh, to extinguish envy, the believer must first recognize God's sovereignty. I just used that word just a minute ago. Uh, Psalm 115, verses 1 through 3. If you want to turn there real quick, I'm going to read it. But Psalm 115, verses 1 through 3. Here's what um, the psalmist says. I really want to make a... Well... No, I'm not going to do it tonight. I wanted to say something about the Psalms, but I, I'm going to quit. Um, I'll tell, tell you later. Uh, Lord's telling me not to do it right now. <laughs> uh, Psalm 115, verses 1 through 3. It says this, Not to us, O Lord, but to your name give glory. Because of your mercy, because of your truth, why should the nation say, where then is their God? But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Did you hear that? And by the way, it's not to us. Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. And folks, he is God. He is sovereign. He's on the throne. He's in control. And so uh, nothing take, takes God by surprise. Why? Because God reigns. If God allows an individual to prosper, that's his business. If he permits another to suffer, then, it, then that again is his responsibility. We must come to trust his ways and not question, question them all the time. Do you find yourself questioning God more than you say yes to him, I obey you, Lord. God's choices are based on his righteousness, his love, and his wisdom. What he does best. And listen to what Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Believing that God is in control will counteract the poison of envy in our lives. Recognize that God is in control tonight. 
You want to win the battle over envy? Trust God for who he is. Secondly, we need to replace envy with thanksgiving. Now, we just got done with thanksgiving as far as a holiday. But folks, we need to replace envy with thanksgiving. When you begin to thank God for what you have, instead of being envious of what you don't have, That is the key. Listen to, uh, see if I can find it here, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Here's what it says. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. It says, See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek what is good for one another and for all the people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Hmm. Some of you trying to find the will of God tonight? Here's some things that he points out. Don't repay another evil for evil. Always seek the good for uh, individuals and for all people. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will. You see, you cannot have a lot of the world's goods and be happy and content because you give God the glory for what you have in the first place. And in the same way that there are people who have a lot, but are unhappy and negative. You may not have a lot of the world's goods. You give God the glory. You thank him for what you have. Because there are people that have a lot today that are not happy. They continue to fill the void in their life with possessions and more possessions. If I can just get a newer model, if I can just get a bigger house, if I can just get this particular job or this particular status in this world, then I will be happy. I will be content. But folks, we know that material possessions cannot fill the God-sized void that's in our hearts. The difference is a matter of attitude and, res and perspective, not what is or is not possessed. In everything, give thanks. When you don't get what you want, thank God anyway. We're coming up on Christmas time. Did you get everything you wanted for Christmas when you was young? I didn't. I was the third of three boys. And then I had my little sister come along, and she seemed like she got everything. And if I got the hand-me-downs, and if they just happened, the clothes happened to still be uh, able to be worn, I, I, I needed to be content with that. I've got to be honest with you, sometimes I wasn't. But, um, folks, when you learn to be with content... What was it the Apostle Paul said somewhere in, a flip, in Philippians? He said, I've learned to be content with a little. And I've also been able to be content with a lot. Regardless, be content with the Lord. So, what are we saying here tonight? Don't be proud of what you have. Be grateful instead. You understand that? Don't be proud of it. Pride goeth before a fall. You may, you know, God may decide that, you know, he told a man one day by the name of Job, took it all away. Took his family, his possessions, and everything. Can you still give thanks to the Lord regardless of what happens in your life? Be grateful instead and allow God to use the possessions that he gives you
to bless your family, and to bless others. And here's a quote that I uh, found this past week. It says, the man who keeps busy helping the man below him won't have time to envy the man above him. And there may not be anyone above him anyway. So, sounds like some, some decent advice, okay? So, that is our Lord with some really good pointers and help, truth tonight to help us battle the subject of envy. Um, I was going to look, there was a couple of scriptures. Um, of course, again, uh, the word envy is used quite a bit. I, I did forget to quote uh, Galatians 5.26. I was there in Galatians 19. 5, 19 through 21. But Galatians 5, 26, this would be a good thing to, to end on. It says, let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And in the context of that passage, it tells us instead to love one another. It tells us to accept one another. It tells us to rejoice and be glad. So if tomorrow I hear about you inheriting some money, I need to be grateful and happy for you. If, uh, if you get some good news from the doctor and I don't, I really need to thank the Lord for what he did for you and say, Lord, I'm still blessed if I don't get everything that I asked for. And then this, I'll close with this. 1 Peter 2, 1 as newborn babes, therefore, rid yourself of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Peter said, if you want to be a follower of Christ, let's not be envious of other people. Let us be content with what we have, all right? Okay, that's what I wanted to share with you tonight. Let me uh, give you some updates as far as our prayer list. They, <laughs> they've been changing as we, almost as we speak. Um, we have a few more people who have come down with COVID. Uh, Wayne Graham, as I shared with you Sunday, uh, does have COVID. But now his wife, Ruth, uh, has uh, tested positive. And then his granddaughter, Samantha Tabor, has tested positive again. This is the second time that she has gone through it. Uh, so let's remember the Graham family tonight in our prayers. Uh, actually, Wayne is doing pretty good. Um, he's been taking some medication that's been very helpful. And I think uh, uh, the other family members are on it as well. So uh, just be praying for them. Uh, some of the others, we've been praying for Jack and Helen Bolton tonight. Uh, Sue Bowen is going back to the doctor with her AFib. She's been helping us this week uh, in the uh, office. Alan Bruns with his ALS disease, and uh, they have not been uh, uh, getting out recently. Uh, Mark Clark has some upcoming surgery. Uh, we want to remember him. Michael Double D and his family tonight. I spoke with Carolyn uh, Egbert. Uh, Richard and Carolyn have uh, moved all in the last couple of months or so to Wichita, but they're still members of our church. And I spoke with Carolyn uh, on the phone. Uh, Richard was diagnosed with COVID. He also had pneumonia. But he is recovering at home and doing much, much better, which is a praise. So uh, remember that situation. Pat Griffith is going to be uh, coming home from rehab, and he is still weak. They're going to try to uh, get some things settled there at the house. Uh, so let's uh, remember Pat and Donna uh, during this time. Uh, Gene Grounds continues to do radiation treatments in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, Jerry Hamm has gone back to the doctor again. They have ruled out MS, which is good. Uh, he, he has had some strokes in the past, but uh, they're going to uh, look at a couple of more tests and see what can be done. 
Uh, let's continue to pray for Tina Henry as she continues to go through uh, treatments uh, for her liver cancer. Uh, Kim, Kim Hubel, uh, she had a new pacemaker put in the other day, and she is uh, recovering at home. Uh, of course, Terry, uh, Terry is coming out of quarantine. Uh, she's had COVID, but she's doing, she never had enough, uh, much more than just uh, kind of a head cold type uh, symptom. So uh, she's been cleared to come back. So she will be in the office tomorrow. Billy Hausman, I think, if I remember right, has tested negative now. Uh, she's feeling better. She was feeling better enough that she called wanting addresses so she could do cards. You know what she does when it comes with the cards. So let's remember uh, Billy and Jim. And then Sandy Killian is at rehab in Broken Arrow. Talked with her daughter this past week. She is doing better. She's still having some issues. Uh, but she is doing the rehab, so uh, pray for Sandy if you would. Chrissy Nelson uh, should be getting over her COVID. Um, Jerry Patterson was in our church uh, service this past Sunday. He's uh, healing from a surgery. Stephanie Plummer, uh, she's one of our frontline people who works uh, down in uh, Muskogee. Uh, she has tested positive for COVID. Uh, she is... Uh, has a few more symptoms than some of the others. She's sleeping a lot and has kind of the flu-like stuff. So remember Stephanie, if you would. And then Charlene Pritchard, uh, she's been going up for some treatments in Joplin, but she is uh, very weak. And so we want to pray for uh, strength for her tonight. Uh, Gayla Flynn's daughter, Rachel Reed, who is uh, pregnant, I don't have an update on that, but she also was diagnosed with a COVID, so let's remember that situation. Uh, the Schilt family, let's remember them tonight as they continue to serve uh, in our uh, community and in our church. Uh, remember uh, them tonight. Uh, Jarrett Turney, uh, who has been doing chemotherapy treatments in Oklahoma City. Uh, remember him tonight if you would. Um, Becky Brewer, again, an upcoming surgery. That surgery may have already taken place. I don't have an update on that, but her son does have leukemia. We've been asked to remember Jerry Crawford. This is a son of a former pastor, Lloyd Crawford. He has stage four colon cancer. And then on the back, uh, an aunt of Chrissy and Chrissy Nelson and Terry Hillis, Sue Hummingbird, uh, passed away, and there will be a service uh, at some point. So I believe that was Johnny's uh, sister uh, that passed away. Uh, we've been praying for Judy Jolly, uh, Tammy Ruhlman, who has lung cancer. Uh, this is Grover York's daughter. And then my good friend Carl Whitlock in uh, San Diego, California, is uh, doing much better after getting a new pacemaker. So uh, do you have any other prayer requests that you'd like to mention tonight? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, she... They weren't here Sunday, but they were here the Sunday before. Um, what I remember hearing from my wife, for sh pretty sure, uh, the good news is that the, the, the tumor there had not grown. The not so good news is that it hadn't shrunk, but that it kind of maintained. And so uh, that's kind of where they were at about, uh, about two weeks ago. Uh, but they weren't here this past Sunday. And I'm going to assume because of the holidays and everything, they probably just were not here. So, but yeah, continue to remember the Henrys if you would tonight, for sure. Yes, sir. Oh, wow. Okay. You said the Thurston family? Okay. So let's remember the Thurston family, the wife, uh, developed COVID and passed. So let's remember that situation then. Okay. Got people all around us, you know. We've got people in the hospital, uh, ICU, stuff like that. Uh, we do have some of our church members that are uh, in like Grandwood, places like that. We're not able to see them. Um, uh, like Sandy Killian, 
uh, if, I go, if I'm able to go down and check on my mother, uh, I might be able to see her through a window, but that's about all that they're allowing us to do. So uh, anyway, just remember these individuals, pray for them, and pray for their families. And uh, remember, uh, again, this coming Sunday, we will have uh, services, and, uh, but we will not have the uh, International Missions uh, banquet uh, next Sunday night, okay? So, again, appreciate your faithfulness tonight. I'm going to close us with a word of prayer, and uh, then we will be dismissed. And again, thank you for being faithful tonight. So let's, uh, let's bow for a closing prayer. Father, I pray that uh, each and every one of us here tonight and those that are watching online would have the, um, the prayer philosophy of Paul. Lord, I, that we would be content with whatever situation. I know what it means to have much. I know what it means not to have any. But the Apostle Paul, regardless, was still faithful. Lord, if our health was to fail us tomorrow, may we give you the glory. If you decide to bless us beyond measure, in the days ahead, may we continue to give you the glory. Father, whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation, help us to be content. Help us to not be full of envy. Help us to not become mad and indifferent over what you're doing in someone else's life. And Lord, may we be content with where you have put us. And if if we're not content tonight, then Father, show us where we need to be so that we can receive the contentment and the joy and the peace that comes through a relationship with you. Father, help us not to have a divided heart. Help us to have one purpose, seeking you. And Father, you do a great work in each and every one of our lives. We pray Lord, for these requests tonight, especially those who are dealing with COVID tonight. And Lord, if I have missed anybody that um, uh, some circumstances, Lord, you know th what they are. And I pray, Father, that you would be with them. And Father, we pray that we would see an end to this COVID-19. I think all of us can, uh, can uh, safely say that we're tired of this. Uh, so, Lord, you, we know that there is purpose in everything that happens. So, Father, we trust you tonight. You are sovereign. You reign. And we trust you tonight. Help us to continue to trust you in the days ahead. Lord, bless these individuals as they leave to go to their homes. Keep them safe. Thank you for the rain. And, Father, uh, give us opportunities to serve you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.